name is Stephen Balcom. I'm the CEO of the Family Online Safety Institute, and uh, welcome to this joint Tech Freedom FOSI event called Revising COPPA. And I want to begin by thanking our co-hosts, and where's Baron now? Uh, he was here a moment ago. Uh, uh, for uh, coming up with this great idea and uh, approaching us. Um, and for the, uh, the initiative to, to make this happen. A as many of you are aware, uh, the Federal Trade Commission issued its long-awaited report on the proposed modification of the Child Online Privacy Protection Act rule on September 15th and is inviting written comments uh, no later than November 28th. Um, only last week, the House Energy and Commerce Committee Subcommittee on Commerce, Manufacturing, and Trade held hearings on COPPA and the broader issues of protecting kids' privacy online. Uh, I was privileged to be one of the six witnesses to give testimony that day, uh, as was uh, Catherine Montgomery, who's with us today. Um, she'll be, oh, there, Catherine. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, we at FOSI have been very pleased with the careful and nuanced approach that the FTC has taken. And we're delighted that, for instance, the Commission has resisted calls uh, for the age limit for COPPA to be raised to 13, for instance. Likewise, we have been skeptical of proposals in Congress for a so-called eraser button, something that presents practical, legal, and technical concerns. Um, in a moment, I'll ask our guest speaker to address us, and then we'll follow a discussion with a panel of experts moderated by Barron. Um, we will also ensure that there's enough questions uh, from the audience, and we'll wrap up around uh, 2.30. And we're also being uh, live streamed, and you can find uh, that on the Tech Freedoms website and just go to the events page. And the hashtag is COPPA, C-O-P-P-A. Um, one last thing I just want to mention is that uh, we will be having um, a further privacy debate at our upcoming annual conference next month. I believe all of you got one of these little cards here. Uh, you can also find more information about that at the FOSI website. Um, and um, I believe that that one we will have uh, maybe Crexus, who's with us today, uh, leading uh, or at least talking from the FTC's perspective on the privacy issues. So I'd like to introduce, first of all, our guest speaker today. Uh, Phyllis Marcus is a staff attorney in the FTC's Division of Enforcement, Bureau of Consumer Protection, assigned to investigate and prosecute deceptive and fraudulent practices. Phyllis, along with Mamie Cresses, spearheaded the revised COPPA rulemaking, so we're particularly pleased to have them join us today. So please join me in welcoming Phyllis Marcus. Thank you. Um, I'd like to give you guys just a brief overview of what the Federal Trade Commission has proposed, and then we'll move right into what I expect will be a pretty avid question and answer session with my co-panelists. Um, as Stephen indicated, the Federal Trade Commission in mid-September proposed to modify five areas of the Children's Online Privacy Protection Rule and to add another area to that rule. Um, we have proposed to modify the definitions which govern the entire rule overall and have um, and have somewhat expanded the scope accordingly of the rule. Um, we have also expanded, or, or I'm sorry, uh, modified the notice, the parental consent, the requirements for confidentiality and security, and the safe harbor program provision. In addition, we've added a data retention and deletion provision to our rule. But before we talk about what we did do, um, I want to talk just a little bit about what we decided not to do. And that's the, Stephen had mentioned that as well. Um, as most of you are probably aware, COPPA covers by statute children that are under age 13. And the Federal Trade Commission, in um, I think a very well-reasoned discussion in our proposal, determined not to recommend to Congress that that age be raised or actually lowered, as, as some people uh, requested on both sides of that. We also chose to leave intact what has become known as the actual knowledge standard in the rule. COPPA's coverage potentially 
is very, very broad. It covers websites directed to children and also general audience websites where those sites or online services have actual knowledge that they have collected personal information from a child. And for a variety of reasons that I will explain and that we're going to be talking about today, the Federal Trade Commission felt quite strongly that that actual knowledge standard, which is a very high bar to liability, remain in place for COPPA to work. One of the things we did discuss in our proposal was the coverage of online services. Typically, what Congress was thinking of in 1998, when the rule, uh, when the statute was enacted, were traditional websites and closed area services such as the predecessor to AOL. And I can't remember, actually, because I'm going to say I'm younger than that <laughs> as to how um, people would access the web. But the, the term online service was never defined. And we articulated in our proposal that that term broadly covers any service available over the Internet or that connects to the Internet or a wide area network. And so what we stated in our proposal was that mobile applications that send or receive information over the Internet and that allow children to do things like play network-connected games, engage in social networking activities, purchase goods or services online, receive behaviorally targeted advertisements, or interact with other content or services would, in our analysis, be online services under the rule. We also indicated that an online service could be an internet-enabled gaming platform, voice over internet protocol services, or internet-enabled location-based services. So that sets the stage for some of our discussions today and also for operators to understand the scope and where we intend to go with enforcement of COPPA. Somewhat recently, we came out with a consent decree involving the operators of mobile applications sold on the iTunes platform that were directed to children under age 13, and uh, people shouldn't be surprised to see additional law enforcement actions in that area as we go forward. Um, the major changes that um, have probably caused some consternation among people in this room are to the definitions of what is personal information under the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. And we have um, hewed very closely to our statutory authority granted by Congress when the act was passed in 1998 to make determinations to expand, if we saw fit, the list of identifiers that might be considered to be personal information under COPPA. The list included by Congress some very typical things that people think of as personal information, phone number, social security number, an address where it includes the name of a street and a city or a town and the like. But Congress gave the FTC some limited leeway to make a determination as to including other identifiers where they permit the online or offline contacting of an individual. And we took that mandate and did some expansion at the outset in 1999 when we proposed our rule and then again when we considered the rule review this time. And we have proposed to include persistent identifiers such as customer numbers held in cookies, user IDs, IP addresses, processor or serial numbers, and unique, uh, unique device identifiers where those persistent identifiers are not used to support the internal operations of a website or service. We've also proposed to include geolocation information, where that information is sufficient or precise enough to include the name of a street or a city or town. We've proposed to include screen names, again, where screen names are not used to support the internal operations of a website or service. And we've proposed to include photos, videos, and audio files where they contain children's images or voices. Previously, persistent identifiers were covered under COPPA, or currently they're covered under COPPA, only where they're combined with other information that is defined as personal. So this is a change to that, but we see a significant limitation being that 
the collection and use of those persistent identifiers would be permitted where they support the internal operations of a site or service. So what's support for internal operations? And that is a bit of an open question. The rule does define support for internal operations as those technical activities that would permit functioning and we ha view that as permitting things like the use of persistent identifiers for user authentication to improve site navigation, to maintain user preferences, to serve contextual advertisements. And that's actually a key permission that you should keep in mind as we talk today. To protect against fraud or theft and other activities necessary to maintain the te technical functioning of the site or service. What we intended with this proposal was to require parental notification and consent before collecting persistent identifiers where they're used to behaviorally target advertising to a child. So on to something somewhat less radical. Um, we have made some minor modifications to the indicia that we would use to define what is a website or an online service directed to children. It's a little bit of a we know it when we see it test, but we have a number of um, identifiers that we list in the rule, including cartoon characters and use of animation, and we've added to that laundry list the presence of musical content or the presence of child celebrities and celebrities who appeal to children. And in our estimation, those additional indicators would um, lead us to make an assessment, not conclusive necessarily, but le lead us to think about whether a website or an online service appealed to children. We have, uh, moving on in the, the definitions, we've changed the definition of collects or collection to, to make it somewhat easier for website operators to offer interactive content to children and not fear automatic violation of the children's online privacy rule if they have a system reasonably designed to delete all or virtually all personal information from a child's posting before that posting goes live. So the current standard is a 100% deletion standard. We've seen fit to propose loosening that standard to an all or virtually all standard in the hopes of encouraging more interactive features by website operators and the providers of online services without them worrying that they're automatically going to be in violation of COPPA if a piece of personal information happens to slip through. An important change that we are proposing to make to COPPA is to streamline the notification provisions. COPPA has two stages of notification. First is the online notice, which is typically known as the privacy policy, and lots and lots of people have talked about how ineffective those are to communicate information to people, and we would agree. And the other notification requirement under COPPA is a direct notice, what you have to directly say to the parent of the child whom you're seeking to engage on a website and obtain from them personal information. We're, we're shortening the requirements for the online privacy policy and going back to the three factors that the statute sets forth that must be contained and, and specifically directing website operators that they need not include some other information in their privacy policies that previously was required. But in its place, we're putting more emphasis on the direct notice that goes to parents. And this is... Um, based on broader discussions in the privacy arena about just-in-time notices and where your best opportunity to reach your audience actually is. And so the analogy in COPPA would be the direct notice to parents. So more and clearer information contained in the direct notice and less background stuff in the privacy policy. We've also updated the ways that website operators can get parental consent from parents by adding some obvious new technologies, um, electronic scans of signed parental consent forms, the use of video conferencing, and the use of government-issued identification checked against a database, provided that that identification is deleted promptly after the verification is done. And what I want to say about parental consent, and I'm sure we'll talk about this more on this panel, is that all of these are electives. These are consent methods that an operator may use 
We are not preferring one over the other. In fact, some of them have been in use for a while, and we're recognizing that by folding them into our proposal. But we have found that these consent mechanisms and the others that already are included within the rule roughly meet the overarching standard of the rule that a consent mechanism has to be reasonably calculated to give you an assurance that the person you are dealing with is the parent of the child. Now, we have done something pretty unpopular, however. In expanding the parental consent mechanisms, we have also proposed to eliminate a sliding scale mechanism of parental consent that's been in use since the rule went into effect, but that was always intended by the Federal Trade Commission to be temporary, which is the ability of an operator who's only going to use the child's personal information for internal uses to reach out to the parent by email and have a return exchange of emails between the parent and the operator to obtain consent from the parent. This has been known as Email Plus, and it's long been recognized as an unreliable method, but one that we were not stuck with, really, but one that we were going to somewhat hold our nose and retain for a while until something better came along. And we have done periodic reviews of the rule and retained for an extended temporary time this method, and we've decided that the time has come to let this method go. But at the same time, we are proposing two new consent processes for us to consider consent mechanisms that might develop. And we are very much hoping that the end result of our proposal is that new consent mechanisms develop. The first process would be commission approval of a new consent mechanism. So we're we're willingly and Mamie and I convinced the commission that it would be okay to tie their hands a little bit by entering into a process whereby p- Website operators, industry members, safe harbor groups, and others could submit to the Federal Trade Commission for our review and for comment by the public a new consent mechanism. And our assessment would be based on whether it meets the standard that I just mentioned, whether it's reasonably calculated to give you an assurance that the person you're dealing with is the parent of the child. And we would take public comment and decide within a set period of time whether or not that standard met the rule, and then it would, if it was approved, it would become a new approved method under COPPA. And the other process that we have recognized in our proposal is that operators participating in a Federal Trade Commission approved safe harbor program can use a method of consent that is permitted and recognized by the safe harbor program to meet COPPA standards. And we view this as enhancing and adding leverage to our enforcement mechanisms. Um, We have also been mindful of burdens that the rule might place on industry and we're looking for areas within the rule where we could open things up and loosen them a little bit for industry or recognize that there are opportunities for industry, for operators to reach out to parents in other limited circumstances without running afoul of the rule. So we've added a new exception for communications between a website and a parent, child-directed websites, frankly, um, where those websites don't otherwise take uh, personal information from a child, but the website seeks to engage the parent and let the parent know that the child has registered online. In the data security, Um, portion of the rule. One of the ways that I've liked to look at COPPA is that it governs the lifetime of information that one would collect from, manage, and ultimately dispose of with respect to children. And so the rule had a confidentiality and security requirement that would require operators to ensure that they themselves have measures in place to keep the children's information confidential and secure. But the only requirement that the rule had with respect to third parties or service providers was that, well, with respect to third parties, was that an operator had to say whether the third parties to whom they were going to turn over information themselves had in place secure and confidential methods to handle the children's PII. And so theoretically, an operator could say, we disclose information to X, Y, and Z third parties, but they don't have any measures in place to keep that information secure. So we've decided that within that that part of having a reasonable program to keep a child's 
information confidential and secure is to ensure that the third parties and service providers to whom you turn over children's PII also have in place reasonable measures to keep that information secure. And then as a natural offshoot of that, we have proposed to add a data retention and deletion provision, which would require operators to retain children's PII only for as long as is necessary to fulfill the purposes for which it was collected, and to properly delete that PII by taking reasonable measures to protect it in connection with its deletion. And so this is, this is what I'm talking about, the lifetime of children's information. And f for us, this kind of closed the loop um, on the intake to the ultimate deletion of the children's information. And then finally, we have proposed to strengthen the safe harbor programs um, I don't know if all of you are, are aware, but the statute set up a program by which the uh, um, industry members and others could apply to the Federal Trade Commission to essentially become parallel COPPA enforcers. And so we have four commission-approved federal uh, COPPA Safe Harbor programs, several are in the room today, and um, other groups can apply to the FTC to help us enforce COPPA, and they have to meet certain requirements. Um, but it, it puts a burden on the Federal Trade Commission as we are reviewing and considering whether to accept safe harbor programs. And we wanted more information about the proposed safe harbor program's ability to enforce COPPA were they to be approved. And so among other things that we're proposing is that the safe harbor programs existing and those that apply would agree to audit their members annually, at least annually, to report the results of those audits to the Federal Trade Commission, and for those that currently are approved to submit their revised guidelines to us within a certain period of time after our rule becomes finalized, when and if it does. So that's our proposal in a nutshell. I can't emphasize to you all enough that it really is a proposal that the Federal Trade Commission takes seriously the comments that we receive. I hope you think that we paid careful attention, those of you that submitted comments at the outset, and we will do so again as we look to modify the proposal, but it's very important to hear from all of you. So November 28 is our, guide, is our deadline as it stands. Hopefully some of you are gathering your clients and figuring out what you're going to say, and we don't want to ruin anyone's Thanksgiving holiday, but um, it, you can't complain about it if you don't complain about it, and you've got to complain about it formally to us for us to take your comments into effect. So that's me, and we should probably start debating it, huh? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for that uh, quick tour of the, the revisions. Uh, very much appreciated. Um, just a quick question for you. Do you think there might be the possibility of an extension of that uh, November 28th date? Well, what I can tell you, should I turn this one? Okay. Um, what I can tell you is that Mamie and I have no individual ability to extend the deadline. And so any... <laughs> Any deadline would have to be approved by the commission. And so there has to be a formal request in writing by a body, and then we ha present that request to the commission. And an extension would not be granted just for an individual group. It would be across the board. Right. So it, using my Swami hat, do I expect that people are going to ask for deadline extensions? Yes. <laughs> do I expect that the commission ultimately will be convinced to extend the deadline? <laughs> you know, why not? This is this is a big task. Uh, that having been said, uh, you know they could put their foot down and say sixty days was long enough, and everybody just start writing and ruin that Thanksgiving vacation. <laughs> but you know I, we expect that someone, at least someone, will ask for an extension. All right. Well, as I say to my daughter, just get it done now. Right. right. I mean, you know, what? Just do your homework. Delay? Get right. it done now. <laughs> All right. So uh, without any further ado, let me introduce um, uh, Baron Soka. Baron is the founder of Tech Freedom, our co-host today. Previously, he was a senior fellow at the director of the Center for Internet Freedom at the Progress and Freedom Foundation. Baron is going to moderate this fabulous panel and then obviously bring in questions. And as I said, we'll wrap up around 2.30. Thanks very much, Baron. Uh, well, thanks, Stephen. Uh, very honored to be hosting this event with uh, FOSI. I think we feel very much the same way that uh, FOSI does about uh, about COPPA, uh, which is to say we this is actually the sort of privacy law that we generally can support. We have some concerns about how it 
could have been expanded, and we're very pleased to see that uh, most of those concerns were, were addressed very nicely by the FTC. So I'm uh, delighted to say that. Uh, we will be filing comments, but let me just uh, get right to it and introduce our panel, and um, we'll have a discussion about each of these points that uh, that uh, Phyllis has raised, and then we'll leave time for, for questions. So uh, just going to take this from, from right to left very briefly. Uh, we have a great panel with us today. Uh, Rebecca Newton is the Chief Community and Safety Officer at Mind Candy, which develops uh, social games for kids. So she actually can speak to some of the concerns that are raised by um, real-world companies that are out there uh, innovating and developing games for kids and trying to do the right thing, but also um, uh, understand some of the real-world challenges raised by COPPA uh, enforcement. Uh, Donna Frazier uh, is at the Entertainment uh, Software Ratings Board, which is one of those four safe harbors that Phyllis mentioned. Uh, Donna knows as much about the um, safe harbor side of this as uh, as anybody. I'm glad that she's with us uh, today. Catherine Montgomery, uh, in the middle of the panel here, uh, teaches communications at American University, played a leading role in um, helping to have COPPA put on the books, and I think we'll speak today to some of the concerns that she and others have about children's privacy and um, uh, some of the ways in which uh, she might have wanted COPPA to go farther or uh, might uh, be maybe happy with the FTC's compromises. And finally, uh, just to Phyllis's right, uh, my colleague uh, Jim Dunstan, senior fellow, uh, adjunct fellow with us at Tech Freedom, and a practitioner of, uh, of COPPA in the real world. Uh, Jim's been a friend for a long time and is a, an expert here who's counseled companies on how to deal with this. So uh, without any further ado, let me get right into it uh, by asking our panel to first start by just taking us back to 1998. And um, Catherine, why don't you get us started? Tell us why it was that you in the uh, advocacy community uh, thought that COPPA was needed and what you had in mind and, and how that should inform our conversation today about revising the rules. Sure, I'm happy to do that, and I'm very happy to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. I may take you back a couple years before 1998. Uh, in the mid-'90s, I was running a nonprofit organization called the Center for Media Education, and we uh, were focused on uh, children's media policy issues. Uh, we have been monitoring the um, burgeoning new uh, online marketplace for children and a lot of people weren't really paying much attention to it or even knew that there was going to be advertising. This is a period, as you recall, when uh, the internet was um, promoted as an alternative medium that um, in many ways lots of people saw as not even commercial. Of course we knew it would be and what we were looking at was how this marketplace was evolving and um, uh, we were concerned that we were finding already in these early days of the dot-com boom, um, websites that were being created specifically for children on a business model of one-to-one -one marketing that was really designed to elicit personal information from children. We began monitoring that, doing research on it. We went to the FTC with our complaint uh, against a particular company and also uh, with a uh, request to the agency to look into the matter and a report that we had done. The FTC then did its own research, finding many, many examples of uh, really quite rampant data collection in the early days and in an industry that was very eager to market to children um, and where we didn't see any restraint, no discussion of privacy, no discussion of any kinds of guidelines uh, regarding children. Uh, so what we wanted was some kind of rules of the road. Now, I will say that there were some other groups, uh, and I worked with a coalition of child advocacy, health, education, and consumer groups in the 90s. There were other groups that said, why do we have marketing at all? Why do we have advertising? We shouldn't have it. And that was never our position. What I wanted and what my group wanted and what most of our coalition wanted were some rules of the game or rules of the road that could help guide the development of this new children's marketplace. And particularly for children under 13 because research had shown for decades that children at this age uh, range uh, were more susceptible to advertising and marketing. That Cognitively they weren't developed. They didn't have the good judgment yet. There were many, many reasons why it was really unfair to them. And there were similar guidelines in other industries such as television. What we wanted was something that was appropriate for the Internet. FTC went to Congress. We had a bipartisan bill 
Uh, we participated heavily in that initial rulemaking, and we negotiated a good deal with industry and had a lot of industry buy in and lots of good discussions like we're having today, or hopefully we ha will have. Um, and it was built to be flexible, and that's the reason why the FTC is now in the process of uh, revisiting some of the rules, and I think uh, that they've done a really excellent job as well. I support virtually all of them, uh, and I think it's not an easy position to be in, but I appreciate what you, Phyllis, and your agency have done. Well, thanks, Catherine. Uh, Jim, before we start getting further down the road, we should probably clarify the difference between COPPA and COPA. So yeah. take us back to 98. We're, we're, we're in a very unfortunate set of acronyms here. Um, but nonetheless, it, it, it's really important. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it, it's very important to distinguish both uh, both of these statutes, uh, because they also play into the sort of the, the, the legal construction of them. COPA was the, the Child Online Protection Act, uh, which essentially dealt with really bad content uh, directed to minors on the Internet, uh, as opposed to COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, which really deals with privacy issues. Um, the, the reason that's important to know this distinction is because COPA uh, has had a very, very rough time of it in the courts, and has basically been struck down every time um, Congress has tried to, to you know, revise it or, or, or repeal it or change it um, as, as violating the First Amendment and other constitutional grounds. Uh, what's important to keep in mind, however, is if you try and take COPPA and sort of slide it closer into COPPA, uh, there are arguments that whereas COPPA has never been successfully challenged um, on constitutional basis, if you get to the point where you are, in fact, in Impinging the First Amendment rights of speakers, um, then you are go going to run smack dab into a First Amendment challenge, uh, and, and you may befall the same problems with COPA. And as we get into some of the the blurrings of the lines between what's the internet uh, and what's an internet service and what's a communication services service, you need to understand that once you get into communication services, we're kind of now sliding towards COPA land. And on that point, let me just uh, mention my own work for just a moment here. So this was the heart of the paper that Adam Thier and I did uh, two and a half years ago on the expansion of COPPA at the state level and efforts to raise the age ceiling and tinker with the directed at and knowledge standards. And our concern uh, then, and the FTC cited this in, in explaining why it didn't raise the age ceiling here, was that you specifically would converge with COPPA if you started to uh, require age age verification of adult users on mixed audience sites, such as those used by teens. So I, I think that's what Jim probably has in mind when he, when he talks about the potential for convergence of COPA. So now that we've cleared up that potential awkward phonetic uh, confusion, uh, so Phyllis started by talking about the things the FTC didn't do. I, I'd like to o open the, this up to the panel to, uh, to hear your thoughts before we shift to what the FTC uh, did do. So let, let's start with the age standard. I mean, Jim... You, you want to add anything more to that point about uh, 13 being the, the sweet spot? Yeah, I, I think I think that as um, you know, as was pointed out, uh, there's a lot of there's lots of good study on this that goes back many 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 years and long before the internet existed, we had television advertising and the television industry has you know has had to deal with this for years and years and years. Um, the first major FCC communications commission action in 1974, the so-called Hot Wheels case, um, and then we had 1990 the Children's Television Act, uh, which clearly established a a 12 and under on one side of the fence and, and 12 and over uh, on the other in terms of uh, in terms of advertising. And and so I think there's there there's there's legion of, of studies out there, and whereas you can always with any bright line test, you can look at it and say, well, you know, is it really 12 or 13 or 13 and a half or 14? I think most people would sort of agree that if you're really talking 17 now, a 17 year old is far different than the 12 year old. Now, the father of two daughters who went through that stage, I can tell you they were very different creatures as 12 and 17 year olds. Um, and so I think I think the FTC is is a statutorily correct and B, I, I don't think there is any any substantial significant evidence out there that would really support just jumping right up to 17 at this point. And, and even if there were, uh, I mean, Catherine, I'd like to hear your thoughts. Even if there were evidence on that, uh, is, is, is that the right question? I mean, is, should, should we be asking uh, instead about uh, where the, the age ceiling starts to get us into COPA land in terms of raising it high enough that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, general audience sites start to have to assume that some of their users might be children and therefore age verify everyone, which was the reason that COPA was deemed unconstitutional. 
Catherine, do you want to jump in? Yeah, first of all, I think the commission did make the right decision. I have never advocated for a parental verification mechanism uh, for over 13, for 13 and over. Um, I, I, for all the reasons people have cited, I don't, I don't think it works. I don't think it's appropriate. I don't think it's how we want to treat our teenagers. Um, however, and I do think it, it may raise some other constitutional concerns. However, I'm on the record, and I'm happy to talk about it later, for uh, calling for some kinds of fair information principles, marketing guidelines for teenagers, because they do have some unique vulnerabilities. They're different from the vulnerabilities of younger kids. But, uh, but they, they're still there, and particularly to this kind of marketing to, uh, and data collection. Well, let, let, let's come back if we so can. We can come back to that later. To but the but end. let me just add one other thing. Uh, the other thing is when we were negotiating for you know, how to make the devils in the detail devil in the details work around COPPA, which we're doing now again. Um, you know, the whole idea of uh, saying, let's just make it a site that's targeted at kids was a decision that I was directly involved in. Uh, and again, some of my colleagues wanted something a little bit blurrier, but I thought this was clearer. Um, and I think that has worked. And it also fits with the demographics of the industry. So, so Catherine, that's an, another thing that the FTC decided not to change is that directed at standard. Right. Uh, and in particular, the FTC rejected suggestions that there should be a per se uh, demographic threshold, that if uh, audience data indicated that more than 20% of the audience of a site was under 13, that the site would be deemed per se directed at children. And instead, the FTC is relying on this uh, this, um, uh, more gestalt approach that Phyllis mentioned earlier that looks at a variety of uh, factors, including whether the site uses um, cartoon characters and other, other things that would be indicia of whether it's directed at children. Do you think the FTC made the right call in sticking with that standard? I personally do. I know some of my colleagues in the in the coalition wanted the uh, percentage guidelines. I just worry that it it, um, it becomes complex. I mean, it, did we did we miss something? We may have. And so I feel an obligation to uh, the um, stakeholders, we were just talking about words we weren't going to use anymore, uh, but the child advocates that we represent, n- not to agree to, to rules that are, are going to fail to protect children. So you have to kind of balance these things. So it's a little bit troubling to me, but I think the clear, we've done it this way, I think this should continue to be the model. In this instance, I think that makes sense to me. Well, let me add that among the factors that we would consider in determining whether a website is directed to children would be intended audience of the website operator as well as empirical evidence of the visitors to the website. What we rejected was a bright line threshold in determining per se whether a website would be directed to children based on a 20% audience share of under age 13. And I, I appreciate what, what the, the commission said in, in retaining that and when they pointed out that to the extent they are expanding or extending the definition of PII um, to have any sort of bright line test would really make it even more difficult uh, right now. I, and I know we're going to get into this in, in a little while. I've, got a, I've just got sort of you know these, these sugar plums dancing in my head, but they're, they've turned sour as to what happens with photographs. You know, and does every elementary school website in the country now become, you know, subject to COMPA because of their pictures of kids. Um, and so there's just, you, you know, I, I, I absolutely agree that that, it, that the, the directed at standard you know, let, really needs let, to stay there. Let's be, so. let's be clear here, Jim. What, what you're getting at is the inclusion of um, child photos right. in, 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 in the definition of personal information, and you're asking whether that in some sense will play a new role in the determination of whether a site is directed at children. Right. Mm-hmm. No and no. <laughs> and we can explain why later. Yeah, if I can just jump in, a school wouldn't have to comply because schools aren't under the jurisdiction of the FTC on COP. Am I correct on that, or would they? Uh, that, not well, I'm not going to say you know, what type of school we're talking <laughs> oh, about. That's true. That's true. Um, but that's true. for a variety of reasons. I mean, one of the things that people have to keep in mind is that the statute was governed at the collection of information online from children. It's not the collection of information that depicts children, but you have to be collecting what we determine to be personally identifiable information from the child itself without proper parental consent where that's warranted. So, Donna, last word on what the FTC didn't do? Yeah, No, I think that's not saying the threshold was the right thing to do, but I think 
particularly for us in the gaming industry, it always proves challenging, and Phyllis, we've talked about this, is that we're dealing with an industry that intrinsically uses some of those checklist items like cartoons, like characters, things like that, that may appear to be directed towards children, but the site is not directed towards children. So it can be challenging for certain industries, I think, when we look at that checklist. I think it's something we need to keep in mind. So, so let's keep going with what the FTC did do. So let's let's start first with uh, with covering uh, mobile. Uh, so uh, Phyllis uh, already alluded to this. The way that the, the definition is written in the statute, it really has to do with uh, with transmission of information over the internet. Uh, and Jim, I think you've you've said that that you think that the FTC. Um, Made the right call there. Um, so, so Catherine, um, that the FTC has sort of said this does cover mobile, but do you think that that's that that goes far enough? I mean, do you have concerns about uh, texting and, and other services that you think ought to be covered? Well, you know, first of all, mobile marketing is huge. It's getting bigger. We know there are tons of kids online uh, and tons of kids using mobile phones, and the, the penetration rate is just really, really fast. So it's an area where we definitely need to clarify that COPPA applies, and I think that's good. Um, I worry a little bit about um, the fact that texting wasn't included. I understood the arguments that were made by the commission, and I read, I read that carefully. Um, but what I do worry about is if there are um, some loopholes here that could uh, result in data collection and marketing that takes place. It kind of makes the rules not work anymore. That would be my concern. Jim, you're, that evolves, I don't know you're a practitioner. Are, are there loopholes here? Yeah, well, you know, I haven't sort of gone through the laundry list of, uh, of how you could get around it. But, yeah, I mean, the, the basic problem is the statute talks about the Internet and talks about the Internet as defined by using the TCPIP protocol. Okay, so basically, you know, anything that connects up into the Internet, either hardwire or, or wired. Well, meanwhile, we have a whole separate set of communications infrastructure in this country called telephones, um, which support things like texting, SMS and MMS, um, and and so the, the question now is what should apply where? The statute only applies to the Internet. It doesn't apply to you know, telecommunications carriers and the, and the communications between people there. Um, yeah, I mean, are, are there, is there abuse of, of, of texting right now? I mean, you know, how many of you have gotten a, a junk text, you know, marketing in the, in the last month? I mean, it's, you know, it, it is fairly rampant. Kids are subjected to it just like, just like we are. Now, whether or not people are going to sort of seek out this loophole and try and find it, I, you know, I don't know. I haven't, I certainly haven't had any of my clients come to me and say, hey, we found a loophole. Let's you know. Let, let's see if we can take advantage of it. Um, but I, I, I think that those who would want to try and take advantage of such a loophole eventually are going to have to get caught up because what they're, the services that they ultimately are going to want to offer kids are interactive services that really aren't going to be available strictly on the telecom side of the house. They're going to have to touch the internet at some point. I think um, I haven't found anybody that's got a really killer app. For games on texting yet, you know, and it may 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 come out of it, but I don't I don't think that there. So so maybe convergence to the internet solves this. I, I, yeah, I think it does in many ways. So well, and also, um, one of the things that we discussed in our proposal is that the word texting is quite broad, and doesn't only refer to SMS messaging, mm -hmm. and. Um, I don't. I don't know that the problem is going to be solved by new applications that are called texting, but that really aren't SMS messaging. Mm -hmm. But they are becoming increasingly popular across the board, where you don't ever involve mm -hmm. a common carrier in the communication, and that would be covered by COPPA. Can I ask a question? I'm asking Phyllis a question. Yes. Any <laughs> <laughs> other lawyers here? Um, what about would do not call apply to texting, and does it? Oh gosh, I mean, it I is a to... it is common carrier. Yeah, there there is, there is a do not text <laughs> list um, yeah, that's right. similar to the okay. do not call list. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But but that's a self regulatory issue. That's not a. No, no isn't that no, covered no. by the FCC? No, yeah, it's, yeah. it's an yeah. FCC. Yeah. Issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so again, moving on in, in the terms of what the FTC uh, did do, Rebecca, uh, so you, you deal in the real world with trying to build these games for kids. Um, so the FTC has eliminated, as we heard earlier, the uh, email plus mechanism. What are your concerns about that? Um, well, I guess I'd just suggest that we consider um, making a better plus to email plus rather than throwing the baby out with the bathwater and, and keeping a sliding scale is is really a viable concept. And, and 
you know, there are everything between uh, people who have sites that where they don't, um, where they just want to perhaps uh, join a birthday club or or maybe find out that a friend sent them a gift. Like on, I mean, with Moshi Monsters and kids can send gifts, and they have something called we have something called BFF News, and it says you know your friend just slimed you or whatever, and to be able to communicate that to them. Um, now, in our, I mean, I don't want to say that we wouldn't, we would just use email plus, just to be clear, because we do um, collect more data, and so we would need to do that. But there are sites, for instance, that I think could still use the email plus system, and so um, I'm concerned about that birthday list, game stats, uh, friends, gifts, um, you know, things like that. Um, and uh, you know, to have full-on verifiable parental consent requires a level of um, identification that uh, is questionable as to um, whether that enhances privacy, and I know that we're going to talk about that later. But um, I think, you know, just my main concern is that keeping the sliding scale for uh, as viable is important, and remembering that we have to use email anyway so it is email we're not really getting a good you know removing email plus because you have to use it if you do any kind of marketing so I want to follow up with you on that on, on compliance but let me let me just clarify first I, I think it might be helpful here to underscore a point that I always make in talking about COPPA and emphasizing that the the verifiable parental consent requirement is triggered by not just sites that are directed at kids, but sites that collect information from kids and are directed at kids. And that collection term doesn't mean just what most people think it means. It's not just that the site is filing information away, but that the site is offering a functionality that allows users to share that information with other users. Right. So, so when you're talking about these situations, that would include, it's not necessarily there's marketing going on or that the site is making a file uh, for marketing purposes, but that the user, the kid, may be able to share something in communicating with other users. Right. But in that case, an operator was never allowed to use Email Plus because Email Plus was only for internal uses of the information only. So in a case that would permit a child to disclose her personal information online or share mm -hmm. with other users or have other users view that information, they were outside of the sliding scale altogether and had to use a different method of parental consent that was I viewed as higher. Mm -hmm. So, so, so then so for Rebecca's purposes talking of... talking about more limited activities, and her suggestion is that we think again about what other method maybe not email but email plus plus might be warranted for those internal uses now one of the things that we said in our um, proposal and that we've really been thinking carefully about is that the statute itself never made a distinction between internal uses of information and external disclosures. That was a distinction that was introduced by the Federal Trade Commission at the point at which we promulgated our rule. And we had discussed in our proposal whether that distinction makes sense any longer. And in order to be statutorily pure, among other reasons, we've decided to do away with a parental consent mechanism that makes a difference between how an operator is using the information or disclosing the information. So where does that leave you? <laughs> uh, I guess I'm a little confused. Can you... Can you uh, Put that in another. I, I'm not getting that. <laughs> okay, in English, um, we we were permitting operators to use email to communicate and get a consent back from a parent, where the operator was going to keep that information for internal uses only. Oh, right. But the statute itself just said that the requirement is to get verifiable parental consent, notify parents and get verifiable parental consent, and didn't say get it this way for internal uses and get it that way for external uses. And so now we've we've smoothed out the difference, essentially, in our proposal. Donna, I'd be interested in hearing, as, as another person right. mm -hmm. involved in this space, what you thought about the proposal to eliminate email plus. I mean, I think that we have been advising our members to, to move away from it, in part because a lot of our member companies are engaging with children in a much more um, direct manner. They're doing chat, they're doing you know, forums where they can openly disclose information, so obviously email plus is not an effective use. Um, but also I think that based on what the rule, the proposed rule now says, it sounds like part of what the email plus function originally was is now moved towards exceptions. 
Um, so just getting that parental consent, I think, is if that's all you're doing, just and you're not engaging with the child, you're not asking them to disclose information, and I think that can be moved to an exception just to get the parental consent. So one time, kind of back and forth. We would support that. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. <laughs> Question though, because I don't, and I don't, I don't know whether. I mean, it not, hasn't been brought up yet, but it was an issue that uh, arose for me when I participated in the roundtable in 2010. Uh, and that is, I heard from a number of the industry people, and several of the commenters, I think, also mentioned this in the comments to the commission, of um, practices where companies were... Um, as, let me just back up a bit. We, when we first talked about all these you know, variations and the sliding scale... The argument from the industry was that, you know, if you make it too restrictive and you won't be able to interact with kids, you'll, you'll really affect the interactivity and, and um, functionality of the site. Um, and what we heard, and so we said, okay, we get that. That makes some sense to us. Um, but what I began to hear at one of our workshops was that it sounded as if companies were using this code of flexibility as a way to do personalized marketing to individual children, and that was a concern that we raised. And I, I guess I'm that directing that at Phyllis. That's good. Well, as I to what, how, you know, if right. that's related to your decision here on email plus, or it's, uh, possibly it's related. Yeah. Or I'm not, I'm not saying no. It's so not related. Other commenters who well, one of the things that we, I think, what you're referring to is that. Um, and, and for those of you in the room who don't know, there were certain exceptions to the need to get right. upfront parental consent by an operator who is seeking to take a limited piece of personal information from a child and engage with them either once or multiple right. times. And so you didn't need to get opt-in heightened parental consent right. for those limited collections and limited uses. And um, one of the things that we started to see, and we've discussed that with a number of the Safe Harbor members, and, and you were on that panel last year, Catherine, mm -hmm. where we talked about operators that have kind of pushed the envelope and have yeah. started to combine more pieces of information that they've collected on the child to effectively personalize the child's experience without engaging the parent in an opt-in consent scheme. And so one of our proposals is to make more clear where the exceptions, mm -hmm. how the exceptions are to be used and when you don't fall within an mm -hmm. exception. And so all of these things, I mean, they are um, theoretically distinct, but they mm -hmm. do kind of merge because the practices start to merge. And we get calls a lot from operators who say, well, if I get gender and I get zip code and I get uh, hair color and I get eye color and I get city and I get state, but I'm not getting address and I'm combining it with the child's email address and I've got this whole little dossier on the child, am I okay? And um, we've, we've given a lot of thought to that in our proposal and have made more clear when you're going to need to get opt-in consent and when you're okay to um, either not engage with the parent or engage with the parent only in an opt-out limited manner. I think also what needs to be taken into consideration is exactly what the company is doing, what their, what their real goal is with the collection of the information. If you're not doing any kind of advertising, and this is not about creating a more robust environment, then really what is the need to collect any personal mm -hmm. information at all. It just just be maybe you're creating a username and a password, and that's it. And, and Donna, here, do you mean uh, collect in the in the broad sense that the statute means it, meaning both that the site collects and that the site allows users to share? No, there's no sharing because I, I I think once you're allowing the children to share either amongst children or however it's being shared, I think there should be a heightened okay. form of parental verification there. So I think if you're just having a site where kids should just go and play a game, and we're talking about game stats, and all you're posting is the username and their stats, I would argue that that is an internal use, and it would fall under an exception. Well, and under our new proposal, you'd be right as well. Because um, when we have proposed to um, include within the definition of personal information screen names or usernames, the exception for support for the internal operations of the site or service would still hold. Right. And 
um, collecting and associating game statistics with a user ID would be precisely the kind of activity that would be support for right. the internal operations. Right. So I want to get into that topic of personal information, but let me just ask one more question here. Jim, do you, do you see sites crippling functionality today? Uh, do, do you think that the children's Internet is, uh, is less useful uh, because of these requirements, because sites maybe don't want to have to go through uh, parental verification? Well, certainly, you know, my clients, you know, we walk through and, and, and try and set up you know, you can do this, but you can't do that, depending on, on where you are on, on, on the sliding scale. Um, and sure, there, there are lots of sites that say, okay, we would really like to go all the way to, you know, to, to C on this continuum, but we're going to stop at B because, you know, we can't support anything more, well, in the, in the prior case, anything more than, than email plus. Um, and so I, it, it certainly does. It, 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 you know, at least those clients that have talked to me, um, it becomes really sort of a vetting of their whole business plan um, based on it. I mean, so it's Rebecca, really driven. What do you think is going to happen uh, as the burden of compliance becomes more difficult? Well, I did a, a cost analysis and on you know not having using email plus um, or using the new systems, and I was I feel like I was uh, conservative and and fair. So for somebody like um, for any of the larger. Businesses, and I'll just use Mind Candy as a, as a, um, for instance, uh, we get seventy thousand registrations a day on average, hundred thousand on weekends, and uh, so using, I, I won't go into all the nitty gritty. I'm happy to do that via email with anybody about how I uh, achieve this number, um, but I worked with a colleague on this, and realistically, it would cost us $12 million a year to, to do away with the email plus system, and, that's, and we're a pretty big company. Um, that assumes uh, at the 70,000 registrants per day that 50% uh, actually go through and click a link or go through some process and that, and then I believe that there's going to be a 50% of those, that 50%. 25% of the 70,000 drop off of people who don't want to go in and put their social security number or whatever the system is that's out there. And um, so, and that's a pretty conservative uh, number. And that 25% will assume go through a, um, a process that's out there, maybe a third party um, verifiable parental consent system or company or something like that, something like PayPal. So, so, it's, so, so it's, it's, not just, it's not just more expensive for you. It's also that oh, some parents are going to maybe not go through this process for oh, their yeah. kids. I, I think it's. Do, yeah. do you think that that might that there might be a concern about the digital divide there? That maybe the um, less sophisticated parents are going to be even more reluctant to do that. I mean, well, yes, I do believe that. Just from talking to parents every day for the last 18 years online. Um, but um, yes, yes, to answer your question, I could go on and on, but yes. Donna? Um, I, I think that this offers an opportunity for Safe Harbors and other companies to kind of think outside the box mm -hmm. in regards of how we engage a parent, because this is about protecting the children, and I think we have to think about how to engage the parent up front, and some of the things we've advised our companies to do is either do parental controls, um, and maybe a robust form of parental controls is a replacement for some sort of email plus verification. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that there are just certain ways to do this without losing the parent, without having to provide, you know, driver's license, social security number, all that sort of stuff, or having, you know, the parent create an account for their child. Um, so I think that there are ways around this. Well, let me ask you in particular about one of those. Phyllis mentioned the uh, the FTC. I think very wisely is going to allow this. Um, uh, they're going to move down from the standard that said that. You have to delete 100% of any personal information right. uh, or get verifiable parental consent to a standard that says you have to delete all or almost all, something that I, I encourage them to do. And I think the idea there is that uh, a site could say that uh, we're going to allow kids to share information, but we're going to automatically filter out things that look like phone numbers, addresses, social security numbers. So to what extent do you see that maybe l reducing the burden and allowing sites to continue offering some interactivity to kids? I think it can reduce the burden. But I think that we also need to also remember the, the burden on the, the cost of doing all these different functionalities for the companies. So engaging a company that's doing, you know, moderation for you or black and white, I mean, all those things cost money to do. So I think if you're going to build a website or you have an existing website like you guys do, um, you, 
looking at the cost of what it is to remove email plus versus the cost of engaging a company to help you do this other stuff. I think those things need to be, you know, compared. But I do think that at the end of the day, there's going to be a challenge in regarding how you engage the parents. So, so how different do you think kids media are going to look after this goes through? I, I'm not sure it's going to look much different, quite frankly. I really don't. I think what's going to be different is how we engage the parent, because I think that's what it has to go back to, is engaging the parent. Well, I, I would just like to say that I would encourage the Safe Harbor programs to think creatively about this. Um, I don't know whether you all work together. There are four. Mm-hmm. Do you, you have a communication among yourselves? Are there... No, we can talk about this later if you want. Um. <laughs> Um, no, I, I, but briefly I'll say that I think the original intent was for the safe harbors to work cohesively together, right. um, and I don't think that that's what's happening. It's become a very competitive environment, and I think that there needs to be, um, I think it needs to go back to what you're suggesting. Mm-hmm. I, I would agree with that. So let's move on to personal information. That's the other really controversial uh, topic here in the, in the changes. Phyllis already summarized the changes that the FTC has proposed to make. I, I want to start by asking about the um, the persistent identifier and uh, and the use of those uh, pieces of information for advertising purposes. Um, just, just Phyllis, in your own words, what, what did the FTC have in mind there in understanding the purpose of COPPA? In our analysis, collecting persistent identifiers to be used to target back personalized advertising to a child was contacting that individual directly online. And so we thought that including those persistent identifiers for that kind of use squarely fit within the authority that Congress provided us. And so that's that should hopefully that's the framework for this discussion here. I mean, we weren't thinking about any identifier that um, was collected from a child. This is one place in COPPA where we have applied a use standard and not just the collection of the information. And, and so in the report, you, you, you mentioned this earlier, you have an exception that says if a piece of information like that is used for the internal purposes of the website, that the that, that use does not require verifiable parental consent, but the use for, as you, as you just mentioned, behavioral uh, advertising uh, to be displayed, that, that would require consent. Well, the, the distinction you've drawn there isn't quite correct. It's, it's not just internal uses versus behavioral advertising. It's... Um, su- support for the internal operations, how that is defined, I think is somewhat up in the air. And that's one area that I would encourage people to comment to us on. Um, but So it's not just on one side you've got internal use versus external behavioral advertising. I mean, there are other external uses that would not fall within support for the um, activities of a website or service that would not be permitted within our proposal. Well, one, one very particular question, and then I want to open this up to the panel. So the uh, FTC says that among those um, those purposes that they would allow would be uh, user authentication, improving site navigation, and serving contextual advertisements. Um, but then you go on to say that um, if you are doing behavioral targeting, that that's not allowed. But um, And then you say, in conclusion, that network advertisers, therefore, may not claim the collection of personal identifiers as a technical function for support for the internal operations exemption. And, and my question is, so is, is the FTC, I mean, the problem, of course, for many websites is that they use, most websites, I would say nearly all, rely on uh, network advertisers to serve even contextual ads. So is the FTC saying here that the site actually has to serve its own advertising and they can't use network advertiser without triggering this requirement? Or do they only have to get the requirement of verifiable parental consent for doing behavioral targeting uh, through a network advertiser? I would say that the latter is more accurate and um, that, that our intention was to target advertising that is based on a child's activities across a web or the collection of those persistent identifiers to deliver back targeted advertising to the child. Um, And we didn't intend to, A, break the Internet, or B, prohibit (laughs) the service of contextual ads. I mean, if you are on a child-directed website that has pink ponies and you are delivering ads about the plush toy pink pony, that's an obvious place to deliver that kind of ad, as long as it's not based on a child, you know, 
traipsing along on the internet and you didn't gain that knowledge that way. So I, I think that there will be additional articulations on this. We'd like to hear from people where they think the limitations on this might lie, whether we got it right or wrong, and whether our language serves the purpose that I've described. Yeah. Yeah. No, go ahead. You know, as a practitioner, I'll tell you, this one probably gives me as much heartburn as anything because I'm the one that's going to have to explain to my client the difference between targeted contextual and behavioral advertising in less than 30 seconds before their eyes you know, roll back in their heads. And I can't do it right now. And, yeah. and is there a really, really good bright line distinction of the difference between a, 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 a contextual and a behavioral? Advertising. I mean, can you look in, sort of in the rearview mirror and, and look at an ad and say, "Aha, that was contextual. That was." Well, I don't no, think you I, can see it from the ad. This itself. is, and that's right. part of the problem. Right. I mean, a lot of this stuff is very, very invisible. Uh, and, but the industry knows when it's doing different kinds of advertising. I'm sorry, I don't buy that. Okay. You know, all you have to do is go online. I'm researching yeah. a lot of this stuff. It's pretty damn clear. Mm -hmm. And I think that this can be worked out. What we don't want to see is a, a system that markets to these young kids based on their behaviors that targets personalized advertising messages to individual children. That well, unless was really their parents one of the major consent. Well, right, right. And, and unless their parents right. are informed of it in advance, mm -hmm. they say, well, that's okay with me. You know, this, I, I don't mind if they're on this site. This is good. I trust them. It's fine. And, that, and that's why I think that this, this balanced approach that the commission has taken is workable. Now, obviously, it's going to have to get worked out. And I'm counting on you guys mm -hmm. and your mm -hmm. friends that you all get along with <laughs> in the safe harbor world uh, to, to make <laughs> you know, and I think they're going to need to be workshops, and you know, to get the to get people to to appreciate how to do that. But it can be done. It can be done. I'm sure. It can. I, I just think that part of what the the, the freak out is is that really what is what is the it depends on the ad. Really, I think there's there's certain ads that maybe are not that that bad or that harmful to the child. It depends on what information is being collected from the site. If the site is only collecting demographics and the favorite your favorite color and all that sort of stuff. What types of ads are really being serviced to an under-13 child that could be that harmful? And I, and I just think that there needs to be taken into consideration exactly what type of ads we're talking so, about. So, here. Phyllis, in particular, did the FTC give any thought to the serving of non-commercial advertisements? Would, would that be covered uh, here? I mean, if, for example, it's a, uh, an announcement that's, let's say, it's targeted towards um, to, to gay um, tweens, uh, that could be served as a behaviorally targeted ad. Would that be triggered by... I would assume that those First Amendment specialists in the room would have a problem with us distinguishing mm -hmm. between the messaging. And so, no, we did not talk about what types of advertising mm -hmm. can or cannot be served to children. We talked instead about the methods used to determine whether an advertisement would be served right. to a child. Right. And, and, but, and uh, I, <laughs> the fact that you're having a little trouble with contacts contextual versus personally targeted. In the children's, in a purely children's world, if, it, if it's a toy site and you're serving like toy ads, right. or if it's a site of you know books online to a kid and you're serving ads for products that kind of match those books, that's contextual, contextual. and probably very effective. Right. right. So it's not, we're not trying to stop right. effective advertising. Trying to say, get the parents' permission if you're following a child around and learning about them all over the place and then so focused on them targeting them. If, it, if it's something that relates to the site and that's effective, great. We want you to so the concern is about interest profiles? No, and, and to your, I mean, not interest profiles within a site. If you're developing an interest profile right. of, of a uh, then, you know, then that we think we need to get prior approval. And as for, I mean, it, you know, conceivably, if a child were on a website discussing what you raise, like a gay issue, it's probably not a child-directed website per se. But certainly, if you want to give that people who go to those sites information that's relevant to them by virtue of their going. We certainly don't want to stand for that. Well, there's a lot more to cover here. Any 
final thoughts on this particular issue of these persistent identifiers? Because I want to ask about the other uh, elements of personal information that the FTC has moved on to. Rebecca, any? So, so I, I, there are a number of different uh, factors Phyllis has mentioned here. Um, we've talked about persistent identifiers. Uh, Donna, you already alluded to screen names and uh, wanting to be able to, uh, to to mention screen names without getting uh, verifiable parental consent for that. Do you want to la- elaborate on that point? Um, I, I think, you know, again, it goes back to the industry that, that we service is screen names, tagger names, all those sorts of things, avatars. If, if they're not combined with any other information that's been collected, I just don't see the harm in being able to allow those to fall under the exception, which they currently do. Um, so I think that it's... Right. right, and they would continue to fall within an exception. We were concerned, and we articulated this in our proposal, about the use of screen names as a universal access point across the web that would permit an operator to identify the user and to target information back to that user. So if there's one screen name that's going to allow you uh, it goes through a portal and allows you entree, and you can reach that child outside of the website, outside of a single website, or we can talk a little bit about families of websites, and actually I don't want to go there. But, um, you know, that's where we were going with this. Right, no, I understand. And we, we advise our member companies that when they are creating a site and you're asking a user to create a username and they've collected an email address, that username cannot match that email address. That username cannot match their name if they've collected their name. So we've asked them to kind of set up a system that's very robust so that there is no matching between the username, the email, and all that sort of stuff. So I think that that is part of our role. That's part of what we're supposed to be doing for our member companies. So so how about location? Uh, Phyllis, do you want to explain what the FTC has done on location? Well, the FTC has done two things, actually, with location. One of the things that we articulated was that we felt that geolocation arguably already is covered under COPPA as it exists because COPPA covers a um, address where you have at least the street name and the name of a city or town. And typically you would get information that's at least that precise when collecting geolocation. But you don't necessarily get it in the same format. You could get coordinates on a map. You can It can be delivered as, um, a, as a string of identifiers. And so to be out of an abundance of caution, and because this is an issue that has garnered a lot of attention on the Hill and otherwise, we propose to separately list, to make it clear for operators for their compliance obligations, that the collection of geolocation information that gives you at least as precise information as street name and name of city or town would be covered as personal information under COPPA. Any comments? Or should we move on to face? So uh, facial recognition, uh, Phyllis, what, what was your concern? The, the, that is, uh, bringing photos uh, alone into the definition of personal information. Right. Okay, so this is something that has, you know, I'll use your term, mm-hmm. Jim, about heartburn. Um, <laughs> you know, it is our proposal now that websites that are directed to children or that know they are engaging with a child should gain parental consent before a child can upload a video or a photo or an audio recording of himself or herself. Right now, under the rule, we say that a photo, in combination with other information that would permit the contacting of a child, would be considered personal information. This proposal is an expansion, and, and we're aware of that. So, so, Phyllis, my question there is, what, what, what is the FTC's internal thinking or, or standard for deciding when the potential for identification is high enough to include that thing in in the definition of personal information. I mean, the technology certainly does exist to do uh, photo recognition, face recognition, but the mere fact that it could theoretically be done doesn't mean that it's uh, practical to do. So how do you decide whether we're there yet? Uh, I mean, clearly you think that we are, but um, I, I think probably it's fair to say that few sites are going to be doing that sort of Uh, photographic um, recognition? Well, I don't think we were only aiming at facial recognition technology. I mean, one of the ways we were thinking about uploading things like video and audio is that, in essence, they are oral chat rooms. And so a a chat room already is covered under COPPA. 
And so this is a logical extension of that as well. Facial recognition technology was another thing we had in mind. Geotagging of photographs was another area that was of concern to us. I mean, I fully expect we will hear from those of you in the room as to whether we got this right or not. But I would think that parents would be concerned about these things. You know, I mean, increasingly with their young children particularly, uh, they're able to post pictures of themselves and videos. I think that parents need to be involved. I mean, it was a cut. And I'm sure you know from our language that we had to make a cut somewhere. We didn't say all photos. Um, and we and we didn't make it more refined than that. I mean, a photo of a Grand Canyon is different from a photo of a child. You know, let us know whether we made the right cut. So I just want to ask. So, so the mere the mere posting of a photograph is not enough. So it's whether or not that photo permits contact with the child. Well, that's the current standard. That's okay. not the standard that we've proposed. Right. So if I'm on Facebook. And I see the photo of what presumably is probably an 11 or 12 year old child. Um, that photo, in and of itself, violating COPPA? No, because what we have done is no, not necessarily. Let's put it that way. What we have done is very strictly maintained the actual knowledge standard, and and so all, every one of our proposals has to be read through the filter right. of whether a website or online service has actual knowledge that they have collected that photo from a child. Okay. So we're not talking about photos of children, mm -hmm. and the site still would have to um, be held to liability only where they had actual knowledge, unless they were a website directed to kids at the outset. And so the bulk of where we expect this expansion to apply would be in the realm of websites and online services that provide uploading functionality to children intending to apply. Apply to children. So, so a profile of, a, of a, a user on Facebook that is presumably that, even though they say we don't, this, this is you know not a site directed towards children under 13, but we all know that that's a fiction. So um, if you have a profile of presumably an 11-year-old child or a 12-year-old child, and you look at the content of that entire profile, and who is who's looking at the content? I mean, if Facebook comes across that profile, right, that's what, Facebook's that's what obligation okay. kicks in okay. under COPPA. Okay. But, but Phyllis, uh, it sounds like part of what the FTC is thinking here is that facial recognition technology is improving, and it's becoming better able to identify people. Um, it, it, would it be the case that um, somebody who, who has a better facial recognition technology, let's say a few years in the future, if they had the ability to algorithmically scan large numbers of photos and make uh, some assessment as to the age of persons in those photos, do you think that would trigger the actual knowledge standard, or would they have to know more? I'm going to hold off on answering that hypothetical for now. <laughs> well, again, the, the concern here, of course, is that uh, you know sites having to come into compliance with COPPA for offering functionality to to kids, even if they may not be uh, otherwise collecting information, could that could you know there could be a, a concern about sites deciding they're going to cripple that functionality or uh, simply not offer it at all. Um, and, and then finally about, about voice, I wanted to ask, the FTC also mentioned that, and you just alluded to this, that voice would be included, uh, but they didn't say anything else about that. There was no um, showing that uh, voice recognition was being used to identify users. Uh, what was the FTC thinking, and, and do you think, what is the FTC's burden in, in showing that something can be, uh, again, used to contact a child? Well, it's clear that a recording could contain personal information about a child, and that, that, that's common knowledge. Um, whether it made sense to distinguish between an audio recording, a video recording with voice, and a photo, it, it, those things seemed linked to each other enough that we would include them in the proposal. Again, whether that gets refined over time, that we'll wait to see. So, so then it's not the voice itself, it's the fact that the voice can be used to share personal information and that that could constitute collection? Right, but that's what you use voices for, right? Well, in other words, uh, what, when I read the report, I, I thought that, uh, that this was saying that any collection of any voice sound uh, and it was, it was done in, in very close conjunction with the uh, discussion of face recognition technology. So I assume that what the FTC had in mind there was that any, any sound of the kid's voice conceivably could be used to, um, to identify that child or match something to them. And it sounds like you're saying that instead it's the, the concern is more about 
uh, if the child records something that is either collected by the website or then shared with other users, that, that, that when the child is speaking, you know, they can share information that would trigger COPPA. Well, yes, in this proposal, we didn't think of every conceivable use or misuse of a child's information. So, you know, th- there can be different rationales for including that information. And, um, and, and so we didn't talk about linking a voice to a photo to recognizing who that individual is, but I guess you've just raised the specter of that as a possibility as well. So. Well, it's a hypothetical. And again, my question is, you know, how real do these concerns have to be? Any, any other thoughts on personal information? So um, we, we, we've talked a little bit about uh, the role that safe harbors have here. So D- Donna, I mean, at the end of the day, so you, you, uh, you're a self-regulatory body. You have some ability to speak to, uh, to parents and to companies. Where do these changes uh, leave you and, and your uh, fellow safe harbors and those that might join in the future? Um, I, I, I think that we need to go back and look at what the original intended role of safe harbors um, were. I think that... Um, you know, the rule says that we are supposed to be holding ourselves and our member companies to um, either the minimum standard of COPPA or a slightly higher standard of COPPA, which is which is what we do. And I think there needs to be some discussion amongst the safe harbors, and we've talked about this with the FTC as far as minimum standards go. Um, and I think that if we have some minimum standards, enforcing all of these rules makes it a lot easier and there's a certain commonality across the board with all the safe harbors which is what we don't have currently and that's where we need to get but i think as a safe harbor our primary goal is to make sure that our companies are complying with the rules but as a safe harbor we need to make sure they're also meeting their business goals so we don't want to interfere with what their end objective is we just need to help them find a creative way to do this um, while complying with the laws. All right, so one, one more just general question here before we do have the questions from the audience. So uh, how, Catherine, how do we strike the right balance here? What, what do you see as the competing interests, and, and do you think that the FTC's uh, proposed changes meet them? Well, I think the, as I said earlier, I think the commission has acted with a great deal of um, rationality and made reasoned decisions, and it appears to have listened to lots and lots of different voices here, um, and is continuing to do so. Um, so I, I think that it's the, the commission is doing a very good job of striking the balance. I have to also say I think the industry, certainly from what I'm hearing, has, has managed to work through a lot of these things. To but strike that but balance of what? What what do you see as the as the uh, what's on the scale on, on both sides here? Well, it's it's obviously you want to balance the ability of industry to you know, survive and do well and thrive, I think it has, uh, with the need to ensure that we protect our children and that we have a system in place that uh, respects their rights, that honors their uh, unique vulnerabilities, that involves parents. Um, and I think we've done both things. Also, the other other issue is uh, ensuring that there's content for kids. There's plenty of content online for kids. So and I think it's all, it, I'm, I'm pleased actually with the outcome. Rebecca, do you, you agree with that? You're, you're in the business of offering think, content to think, kids? Oops, sorry. I think that's going to be true in a couple of years, but I don't think we're there yet. And I, I know there's lots of content right now for kids, but there's not much interactive content for kids. And I know just from being in this industry that kids don't stay very long. Be- with their because kids. of COPPA, you think? Uh, I, I wouldn't say. It's hard to know because a lot of people don't don't use COPPA, but so I wouldn't want to say that because of COPPA, but I think we're several years away from uh, from the happy world of everybody's making money and ver- getting ve- verifiable parental consent. I don't think we're there yet. Let me add, I want to add one more thing. What I'm, what I'm pleased about particularly is that we were able to create some rules when we did so that we didn't see an industry grow up around a business model that's really based on treating children unfairly and collecting reams of data from them and targeting them personally. And that's what we would have seen. I'm certain of it. But, but Catherine, I mean, as we've discussed, the collection here means not just collecting for, for marketing purposes, but giving kids the very sort of interactive functionality that Rebecca is talking about. So this is a double-edged sword, in other words. Um, it, this both limits marketing and also limits the ability of sites to roll out uh, tools that kids could use that could uh, be educational for them and train them in digital literacy. So don't, don't you see that as another uh, interest that, that's in the, the balance here? Or Jim? Yeah, actually. I, I, actually that's a softball I for Jim. Uh, <laughs> He's got his hand on the yeah, I'm ready, I'm ready to go. No, I, I, 
<laughs> yeah, I want to relate one, one specific story. I, I have a very ma- major media client who uh, rolled out an, an online game featuring some of its television pro- projects, uh, products. And the online is a multi-user, massively multi-user game. Um, well, very well reviewed, very well received, um, and it basically lasted less than a year. And in sort of the post-mortem of it, uh, one of the conclusions was they had chosen because it was you know it, it was a COPPA site and they and believe me I beat them hard to you know to make sure they complied and they went with one of the safe harbors um, but the conclusion was that they could not they could not because of the uh, got to filter everything um, they ended up going with Which the FTC is revising to right right they, they went flexible. to a pull down menu. Uh, communication system. You know, so to in order, in order to converse within this game, you basically had to pull down the menu, and you had like twenty things, or you know, so that you, you couldn't share say. personal. So, information. so you, exactly, so you could not share personal information. Um, and ultimately, they they concluded that the in-game community aspect of the game was so lacking, was so failing that what did kids do? They stopped playing their game and went off to World of Warcraft or one of the other, you know, more adult games um, that they just signed up for and you know and and got their parents' permission to sign up or just did it themselves. And so, you know, here's the client going. You know, we spent all of this money. I mean, a lot of money on on these massive games are you know are eight nine figure you know uh, uh, productions. And at the end of the day, it was like it doesn't work because kids aren't going to play it because they can't communicate. In it. So. Well, let me respond to that just a little bit. There's an interesting article in today's New York Times. I think about Facebook and right. kids, and this is reminding your comment is reminding me a little bit about. Uh, of what Mark Zuckerberg said back in May, that he can't have kids on Facebook because Kaba doesn't permit him to have children on Facebook. And that's just, that's an inaccuracy about the structure of the rule. Now, they have chosen not to have children on Facebook, and your client as well. I don't want to be too blithe about it or, or tongue-in-cheek and not recognize the, the business decisions that went into why they didn't want to scale parental consent. But it didn't necessarily have to be those choices at the outset that led to the demise of the client. So, Jim, what, what are the costs here? And do you think the FTC is being realistic now when it estimates how much more expensive COPPA compliance will be? Yeah, I, I, uh, um, very few people ever wa- read the Paperwork Reduction Act sections behind, you know, which, which they're required to do. Uh, I tend to do it because every once in a while there's something really interesting in there. Um, I think, unfortunately, the FTC severely underestimated the, the, the cost, the proposed uh, um, cost of, of implementation. For one thing, um, I believe they, they pegged the uh, hourly rate of lawyers uh, at COP at $125 an hour. Um, I'm pretty cheap you know, by this town standards. And 150 Okay. Um, you're not going to find a qualified COP lawyer at 150 bucks an hour. Well, interestingly, we have to use the Bureau of Labor Statistics rates for that. And so our, our hands are tied as well when, when we factor in those costs. But point taken. So clearly BLS is understating inflation. Well, uh, so I want to open this up to questions uh, before giving our our panelists uh, closing uh, comments. So uh, please, I'm sure that there are lots of questions out there. I promised Adam Thier I would give him a crack if he wanted to ask one. Oh, my gosh. Put your whip away, Adam. (laughs) I I know that... uh, (laughs) Actually, I do have one. Phil... Uh, Adam Thier. I'm uh, with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Um, Phyllis, on that last point about Mark Zuckerberg and his comment, that's an interesting point, but I I guess it raises this question of the unintended consequences of COPPA and what it's meant to create sort of 13 as a radioactive age for a lot of websites and services online. And sure, it's true. Facebook, in theory, can comply. Facebook's a big enough player and has enough money, it probably even could. But it does create compliance issues and legal concerns for a company, especially a smaller one, to comply. And there's this question of, you know, does it make any sense or what are we doing to sort of bifurcate the online world between above 13 and below it? And what kind of crazy incentives does it create for parents? And I've seen some research lately that's in the peer review stage that suggests that it's creating a lot of, well, a generation of sort of liars and lawbreakers among both parents and kids who are out there basically telling their kids, like I do sometimes, about how to evade this law. Um, so maybe I should say, hi, I'm Adam Thier. I'm a cop a criminal. Because uh, uh, I do sometimes tell my nine-year-old daughter, you know, here, this is the way we'll get on this site. And what I care about is what happens not before they get in the door, but what happens after and what that environment looks like. That's what I really look out for as a parent. 
But um, I guess the question is, with a lot of critics saying, you know, it's uh, one gentleman famously said uh, two weeks ago that it's the, um, the most violated law among kids since the speed limits and drinking ages. Um, but the reality is we don't eliminate those laws because people break them. They still set a good standard, and I think COPPA sets a good standard. But does it create these sort of negative disincentives or these uh, unintended consequences and leads people like Facebook and even smaller sites to just sort of hear no evil, see no evil, like, oh, there's no kids on our site, you know. The kids are all over it. There are people registering Facebook accounts in their kids' names while the kids are still in the mom's womb. You know, I mean, so it's, it's happening. Kids are online. But I'm actually going to turn that over to Catherine because I, I think, <laughs> because, it, you know, I'm, I'm the enforcer. And I'm enforcing this statute, and, and I'm doing so willingly mm -hmm. and, and thinking through some um, modernizations to it. But I think, um, Catherine, you've been able to see the history of it and, and what the intent was, and, and also you're engaged in, in the psychology end. So if you want to take that. Look, uh, I think what you said about Facebook is, the, is right, that Facebook made its own decision. It could have chosen not to... Um, uh, kick kids off or not allow kids who are under 13 and it, it could easily create a space create a, a way to participate for kids under that age um, no law is perfect I can't keep kids from lying I can't keep parents from lying I think what's important about this law is that it has created standards for an industry that is directing its content online to kids and um, uh, we ha we've seen, as I mentioned earlier, the emergence of um, of online content that is 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 not in the direction that it would have been in in terms of the kinds of uh, practices we definitely would have seen in an earlier period. So, and in terms of kids, you know, being online, I think each parent has to make his or her own decision. They're not violating the law if they if they try to get around it in this way. It's not they they are not. You know, I mean, is it does is that a good example? I'm not sure. I think that there's also some issue in regards to just educating consumers and businesses as well yeah. about the law because I just don't think that enough people know about it. So you have companies who do know and have made a risk analysis that are not going to comply because what's the what's the real risk factor in getting you know an FTC sanction against you versus just going out there and playing the game? I also think most parents don't understand and most children don't understand why am I being blocked from this site? So I think that there needs to be um, some level of education and outreach and maybe that's part of the role of safe harbors. I have enough to do, but um, <laughs> I, maybe that is part of what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah, no, in, I would, in, in I connection with the FTC. Right. So, so Catherine, uh, if, if you you seem to be generally happy with what the FTC has has done here, uh, and if you think that COPPA shouldn't be uh, expanded in the way that some other folks have have proposed, I mean, this is not a straw man. There have been other folks in other states who have proposed raising the age ceiling and doing other things to uh, put COPPA on steroids. Um, and and I think you you probably agree that that's unwise, but. It sounds like you do want Congress to, to do more for teens, or you, you think there's some need that's not being met. What, what do you think that is? Here are my concerns about teens. And again, I've monitored this marketplace from the earliest days, including what happened after COPPA when the decision was made not to apply it uh, over the age of, of 13 or of thir over 13 or over. Um, and, and what I've seen is the emergence of a robust uh, business model uh, that's based uh, in large part on a huge amount of data collection. Uh, there are lots and lots of teens online, um, but there's no um, sense uh, in the industry of any kind of responsibility to treat uh, teenagers fairly. They're encouraged to give a lot of information, uh, but they're not really made aware of what's being collected from them. They're really not ma being made aware of how the business model works, and I think there should be an obligation uh, for those companies that target teenagers to do that. Now, this is not, as I said earlier, a parental ver verification model at all, but some acknowledgement of their responsibility for uh, fairly marketing to young people who are really growing up in this culture and in this marketing system and being socialized into it and should be aware enough about what their choices are in terms of data collection and, and could opt in and, and know what's what's happening. So you've talked about two different things there. Well, one is the notice. So do you, you're not satisfied with the industry's uh, icon system for labeling behaviorally targeted ads? No. Any other comments from the rest of the panel? <laughs> An eraser button, perhaps? 
No, we, we, this came up in, in, at the hearing the other day, and, and I do understand the concern that, you know, kids, I mean, the other thing is we know from a lot of uh, emerging research and uh, on, on adolescents, they're not totally grown up yet. I mean, as any parent can tell you that, they, they still, they don't necessarily uh, always use good judgment. We know that their brains haven't fully developed yet so that they can make decisions uh, thinking about what the consequences are always. They're very influenced by peers. They are, there are many things that can make them sort of susceptible to um, uh, to, to techniques online that can take advantage of them. Um, um, and they often, you know, they want to. They are exploring their identities. They're posting a lot of things online. Uh, and then the question is: Is there a point at which they should be uh, have some ability to take those things down and not have them up anymore? I realize there's a whole bunch of legal arguments about it, but I also understand, as somebody said the other day, that you know, young people should have some way of um, controlling their virtual identities and finding out some way, you know, not to keep things up there forever. And with the person you just described, I mean, that I know a lot of 20 and 30 and 60-somethings who, who might fit that yeah, bill, too. Like, so so, like so the other question, then, is, is is there an age threshold at which it's no longer appropriate to be quite so paternalistic? I mean, do we, do we say that 13 to 18 maybe needs some special protections, and then above that we're willing... Well, I mean, we say 18 already. I mean, I think that's a really interesting debate in terms of public policy that we're all having here. When are they grown up? We know that they're not really totally grown up at 18, but we do know they're adults legally at 18, no question about it. Do we let them drive? Uh, do we let them get driver's license the way I did? No. You know, there are many more restrictions on kids than there used to be. But, but what, I, what I'm really asking I is... I'm more inclined to be, you know, you know fairly... Um, I, I want to see young people growing up becoming more responsible. I am less paternalistic about it than a lot of other people might be. What I'm looking for is responsible behavior from companies to treat young people fairly and not take advantage of them. And, to, and just to create a kind of marketing culture that honors them and respects them in ways that I'm not seeing now. So you would agree that that, uh, that, that should stop at 18? I mean, in other words, that sort of well, journalism... Well, at 18, we can start treating them just rotten like we treat everybody else. No, I think exactly. everybody. I, listen, I think adults need privacy protections. I've said that all along. I said that throughout the 90s, that it's not just kids. Um, and there are many you know, proposals out there from my colleagues in the privacy community. Well, any other questions for the audience? Hi, Guilherme Roski from Common Sense Media. Um, I wanted to get to a point that was made earlier, uh, and uh, Kathy touched on this as well, is that you know, if a, when a parent or a child signs up for an online service in violation of the terms of service of that online service, they are not a COPPA criminal uh, because COPPA doesn't impose restrictions on the parents or the children. Now, there's a whole other uh, discussion out there over whether violating terms of service makes you a criminal. Uh, but uh, but that's not uh, an FTC COPPA concern. Um, yesterday, there was a, a, a disclosure by, by uh, several consumer privacy groups of some research about several websites engaging in a, the information leakage. And that's when uh, the websites would, through their technology, via referrers or other things, send out uh, information about their users to third parties, such as advertising networks. Uh, this would include things like uh, usernames. Uh, they noticed that the OkCupid website was releasing uh, the frequency of drug use of their, un of their users. This is a, a field you fill out uh, when you join this website. Uh, but they were sending this to advertisers. Uh, would this be included in the kinds of things that uh, when the FTC is proposing that usernames, uh, when, when used besides the internal operations, uh, would this be part of that? Well, I can't see that intentional data leakage would be um, contained within a definition of support for the internal operations of a website. And so c collecting usernames and IDs to facilitate the functioning of your own website is different from intentionally leaking that data elsewhere. If the data was not kept securely, and I don't know the details of the instance that you're describing, but if the data was intended to be kept solely internally and would fall within support for the internal operations, but the operator did not have reasonable procedures to keep it confidential and secure, other parts of COPPA would be implicated as well. 
And uh, on the question you raised about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, people have been prosecuted simply for violating uh, terms of service. And uh, there's a pretty broad consensus from left to right that that's uh, a gross abuse of the criminal law. And we've actually joined uh, Tech Freedom along with another, a number of other groups, including the Electronic Frontier Foundation and the Center for Democracy and Technology, in a broad coalition effort to get that, uh, that law updated. And if anyone is interested in that, there is actually an, uh, an amendment that's pending right now that would uh, do something to fix that particular problem. So the COPPA cops will not be coming after uh, Adam Thier here, although perhaps they should be. <laughs> Any final questions? Hi, Victoria Kemp, Screen Retriever. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say thank you all for doing you know, the work that you do. I really appreciate it as a parent and also you know, in the, the job that I do, which is internet safety. Um, I agree with Catherine. I think kids are not miniature adults. Um, on the other hand, 18, if you know, 18 year olds are allowed to go in the service, military service, then I think that is a natural cutoff age uh, in terms of uh, you know the restrictions. Uh, and we, that's how we view it with our what we do in you know, internet safety. Um, but one thought that I have here, as I'm looking at everybody, and I feel this way with internet safety as well, is that. I think parents have really been left out of the picture, and I think that that's a real problem. I think if parents are made aware of some of the issues about, um, you know, the targeted advertising, et cetera, I think that they would be really, you know, get more on board and pay attention. You know, this kind of reminds me of back in the day when, you know, my parents certainly b both smoked cigarettes. And they smoked cigarettes because they didn't know any better. They weren't considered bad for your health back then. And it wasn't until there was a, you know, campaign that, and then, you know, labels on cigarettes that, that stated these can cause cancer and they're bad for your health that something, you know, changed in this world and far few people, fewer so the, people. So the question is about the need for greater public awareness and well, how to well, build that? Yes, exactly. Uh, greater public awareness. And, you know, and actually, is there a way for some of these sites that are actually targeting kids and doing this kind of advertising, collecting data, to put an alert, you know, put an alert for parents to be able to respond to so that they're aware, you know, kind of like the cigarette package? Anyone? Uh, I'll just say that the, um, if you look at the, the congressional history of, of COPPA, uh, the, there's a very clear statement from the record of just before COPPA was passed that COPPA had four intentions, and the first two goals were about enhancing parental involvement in children's online activities. So I think that that is very much consistent with what you're asking about, and I would certainly agree that uh, education's important here. So I, I, and we'd probably all agree on that. Yes, and, and I do agree with you as well. I mean, there are about about the need for parents to be aware of the kind of um, uh, marketing system and data collection system that we have in the digital media now, because it's not well known necessarily. There's been, you know, those of us who are working on the issue have been able to get more coverage. There have been, you know, in the press, Wall Street Journal and uh, other uh, reports that have um, uh, made the public more aware of it, but there's still a lot more that needs to be done. Oh, we have time for one more question. Very quick one, please. Over here. Uh, Phyllis, you mentioned um, Can you family. identify yourself, please? Oops. I'm sorry. Hi, I'm Denise Taylor, Privo, one of the four safe harbors. Um, Phyllis, you mentioned family of sites. So when we start talking about like a um, ABC company unique ID that allows you access across all the sites, do you believe that it's possible to get informed consent for a universal ID across a family of sites? And have there been any questions about that? Well, I think that's one of the questions that we expect to hear input on during the rule review. And um, I knew the minute I said the word family, <laughs> I was going to kick myself under the table because there are families and there are families. And um, just like there are analytics and there are analytics, another word that didn't come up today. But, um, you know, that that's something that we need to hear input on. I mean, how broadly is your family of websites and whether you would fall within support for the internal operations of a site or service when you have a universal logon that crosses your um, corporate sites as opposed to all of your affiliates. I mean, the, the contours, one of the, one of the areas I'm really going to ask people to provide input on is that definition of support for internal operations. I mean, right now, we kept it 
almost unchanged from the current rule, except that we added to the definition um, activities that support the security of a site. And I, and I think that was an important expansion, but there, there may be some room for refinement so that we don't leave people unclear in the corporate family of websites hypothetical as to whether they would need to be getting verifiable parental consent for a universal logon or not. Okay, lightning round, closing statements. I'll take it. Here we go, uh, left to right. Rebecca? Uh, thank you. I, I just want to say to Phyllis, Mamie, and everybody involved that um, a thank you for getting all the information and spending the last few years um, putting together uh, your revisions. I, I really, uh, when Phyllis said at the beginning that they take it seriously, that they, you know, nothing's set in stone and they want to take comments. I truly believe that, and that's great to hear from a, a government group. And, um, um, and I just want to also thank you for recognizing that disclosure of PII can reasonably be mitigated, for instance, with whitelists or some technology, future technology, current technology. Um, I'm still advocating that the FTC maintain the sliding scale that today we call email plus. The current and proposed methods um, are not scalable at this time, in my opinion. And for instance, my company can't Skype 1,000, let alone 17,000 adults a day for verifiable parental consent. Um, so let's sunset the confirmatory email within Email Plus and replace it with something better or we'll make, make it really difficult for startups, small businesses. Mind Candy wouldn't have been able to do this if... if uh, in, under the current proposed system if we'd known that it was going to cost us eventually $12 million a year to, to do this. Now, I want to say again that in a few years, I think we won't have this issue. Somebody will come up with some technology, and I know that that's part of what the FTC is working towards, and so I look forward to that day. But in the meantime, um, I just would like to advocate that we keep that email plus plus or make it better instead of throwing it away. Thank you. Donna? I'll keep this um, short. I just want to first thank um, Fozzie and Tech Freedom for having this panel and um, obviously for the FTC for, I think, um, creating a document that I think um, we were able to actually foresee a lot of the proposals and I think at um, ESRB Privacy Online we um, don't foresee having to make a lot of changes to our guidelines because we were, I think, able to look forward um, and have been actively working with our member companies to come up with some very creative solutions. So I think moving forward, I would say that for the safe harbors in general, I think that is really what we need to start working towards doing is collectively and individually creating minimum standards and working towards um, better creative solutions for companies to comply. All right. Thank you very much. I think I'm very pleased that you asked me to participate in this panel. It's been a very healthy, robust exchange of ideas. We may not all agree, but I think it's been a healthy exchange and uh, a very informative one as well and a very important one. Um, and, it, and I'm very happy that COPPA has helped create the framework so that we can have these kinds of exchanges and so that we can also help build a culture in the, in the digital media that does treat children and um, young people fairly. And hopefully we can continue to have a national dialogue about a lot of these issues because I think it's very important that we do so and to hear from competing interests and continue to um, move forward. Thanks. As a practitioner, one of the things I've always loved about COPPA is it's relatively, in its present form, it's relatively simple. I can I can explain it to my clients what they can and can't do. We can walk, walk through it. I, I would really point everyone to, footnote 41 in the FTC order where they sort of laid out some of the enforcement actions, and you'll see it's very broad, the enforcement, everything from music downloads to social network or to, to desktop applications. And so it's a very robust, it's a very, it's a wonderful, I think, law. Uh, the more we start to glom onto it, the more complicated it's going to be, the more difficult it's going to be. I would also say that the more we try to get into some some of these areas, the closer we're going to get to towards COPA, 
problems of First Amendment and other constitutional areas, and so there's got to be full record support. I mean, even though the FTC was given leeway by Congress in the statute, it's, any changes to a regulation still have to be supported by, by concrete evidence, and just this, I think my kids are going to lie, and so we've got to get rid of email plus, I don't think would, would, would stand. And finally, the one issue we haven't raised today that we really got to think about is, what do we do with all the existing operators who are out there right now? Do we grandfather all the existing databases? Are they going to have to go retroactively now back and, and dump their email plus and do that? That's a really large, large issue in implementation that I think is going to be, that, that we've got to keep an eye on. Thank you, Mary. Okay. Um, this has been such an interesting area to work on. And I really must say, just from a personal level, when people ask me about my job, I, I'm coming on 13 years at the Federal Trade Commission, and I can't smile enough when I talk about how engaged I have been in something that is both has a finger on kind of the heartbeat of, of, of what's happening technologically, but also personally satisfying. So, um, Adam, you might be a cop, a criminal. But and um, I'm not going to say I'm a I'm a cop lover, but I am um, pleased that 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 I've been engaged in this way. I also marvel at the prescience and the flexibility. I think that's that's just been so fascinating to me because when you watch the sausage getting made in the way legislation is created, this was an act that took four months to come from conception. I know you were thinking about it, Catherine, for more than that, but really four months from introduction to passage. <laughs> And then, um, and then some more time to work out the rules. So it's a, it's a soup to nuts project for us as well. Um, I can't stress enough that this is a proposal. It's a proposal that we've given a lot of thought to, but nonetheless, the FTC is not so rigid as to not make changes where they're warranted. We are going to take your input very seriously. I actually think that we're going to get more concrete, useful input this go-round because we have proposed to all of you actual language. And so you're not just thinking about the theoretical areas that could warrant change. Now you've got language. And so it's the time for you to tell us whether you like it or you hate it or you could live with it or you could live with it with X, Y, and Z tweak. Um, but, but kind of quietly hating it isn't going to help. So um, very active thought and input by you and your clients is going to be warranted here. And thank you for letting me speak today. Well, thank you all for coming. For my part, I'll just say very briefly, uh, remember that uh, all these uh, questions about trade-offs, they're all made on the margins. So the question isn't about $12 million in the aggregate. It's about uh, really, you know, cost and benefit of is it worth providing this functionality? Is it worth uh, rolling out this new thing? Or should we cripple the functionality or simply wall it off from kids? So those those decisions are always going to be trade-offs that are made in the real world because at the end of the day, these sites, they're not being run, most of them, uh, for charity. Most of them are being run to try to make money, and we should encourage that in a way that's consistent with uh, empowering parents to make choices for their own kids. And second, I would just say that... Uh, uh, the reason that I'm here today to, to in, in actually celebrate a, a law, which is very rare for us at Tech Freedom, is because you know our approach is one really of, of, uh, of pragmatism, principled pragmatism about privacy, which is basically to say, look, if there's a real problem, let's identify that. Let's look for, for narrow solutions that are uh, clearly cabined and yet also flexible to keep up with technological change. And I think, if, if anything, uh, folks on the Hill would do uh, well to look at COPPA as a, as a roadmap for legislating smartly about privacy and and avoiding some, um, shall we say, more draconian and sweeping solutions. So uh, that's uh, my part in this. I want to thank all of you for coming. Remind you that the deadline for comments, unless it's extended, is, as you already heard before, November 28th. So I look forward to enjoying my Thanksgiving holiday, just like the rest of all of you. The video from this event will be available on our website, on FOSI's website. And of course, this wouldn't have happened without the uh, co-sponsorship here of FOSI. So I want to thank Stephen Balcom uh, and his team as well. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all at our next Tech Freedom event. Thank you. Thank you.